Just before we begin, a thank you to Dashlane for sponsoring this video. Dashlane is a desktop and mobile app that stores and secures your digital life. From saving passwords and credit card information, to alerting you if your accounts are compromised. More on Dashlane and my exclusive promo code for their premium subscription later in the video. Anyone can witness a time slip at any time without realising it. In the moment it may seem mundane, or even a surreal affair, which many might simply brush off as a dream or fleeting oddity. Yet, those who report and investigate these strange events refuse to let go of the experiences, and instead pose a question to the rest of us. Is it possible that the fabric of reality can bend to show us, or even transport us to, another time? In the autumn of 1957, three young British Royal Navy cadets, William Lang, Michael Crowley and Ray Baker, were performing a routine map reading exercise. The idea of the exercise was simple. They were supposed to walk across a few miles of countryside, then report what they had seen to their superiors. As they traversed across rural Suffolk in England, they saw the picturesque village of Kersey in the distance, its church bells ringing out for a religious service. Yet, as the three descended into the village, a miasma of stillness and quiet engulfed them. There were no church bells ringing. In fact, there were hardly any signs of life at all. The cadets reported that there were no people, only some ducks splashing noiselessly in a nearby stream. Not only that, they claimed that the trees in the village were all a verdant green, as though it were spring or summer, despite it being autumn. They afterwards described the village as being almost medieval in appearance. There were no wires overhanging the streets, and not a car in sight. As this was 1957, there should have been some. They claimed that the houses all looked to be hand-built timber-framed, with the most modern thing about them being their glass windows. Strangest of all, however, was that the cadets could no longer see the church's tower, which they had definitely seen from a distance, and is a hallmark of the village of Kersey to this day. Whilst wandering the eerily quiet streets of Kersey, the cadets supposedly peered in through the windows of what they assumed to be a butcher's shop. They could see two to three skinned oxen carcasses hanging inside. They were green and rotting. This led the cadets to assume that the proprietors must have vacated the building some time before. The cadets felt uneasy. The unnatural stillness of the village was smothering, and so they hurried to leave. However, once they were outside the village, it was as though everything returned to normal. William Lang later explained how suddenly we could all hear the bells once more, and saw the smoke rising from chimneys. None of the chimneys were smoking when we were in the village. Gripped by what he described as a weird feeling, the three of them ran for a few hundred yards, in an attempt to shake it off. This experience left such a profound effect that decades later, in 1990, Lang flew to England from his home in Australia, to meet with Andrew Mackenzie, a psychical researcher, so as to investigate the matter further. Mackenzie was extremely interested in Lang's testimony, and together they returned to the village of Kersey to retrace the events. Mackenzie's research revealed that the building that the three cadets had seen as a butcher's shop had not been involved in that trade in 1957. However, records exist to show that the building was registered as a butcher's shop from 1790 until 1905, at which point it became a general store. And whilst the documentation is lacking, Mackenzie has stated that there is evidence to suggest that the building was associated with the butcher's trade for a much longer time, perhaps even to the time of its initial construction in 1350. How could the cadets have possibly known this information? As such, this revelation helps support the possibility that Lang, Crowley and Baker experienced a time slip and stepped back in time that day in Kersey. In the years since the peculiar incident, many have criticised the three for having had an overactive imagination. 
Others have scoffed that the boys simply misinterpreted the genuinely old appearance of the village for something otherworldly. After all, as it was a Sunday morning when they came across the village, local residents may have still been at home or at church, rather than outside on the street. Yet, how they saw a butcher's shop in a building that had not been a butcher's in over 50 years remains a mystery. Another puzzle, unable to be resolved by simple dismissal of the case, is why the cadets could not see the tower of the church from within the village. The oldest parts of St. Mary's Church in Kersey date to the 12th century, with the tower having been finished in 1481. Now a protected historical building, the church would have most certainly been visible from both outside and inside the village in 1957. For this reason, Mackenzie believes that the enigma of the church's tower is one of the strongest pieces of evidence for the cadets having either visited or had an intense vision of a past time. As the construction of the tower of the church was halted around the middle of the 14th century, after half the population was obliterated by the Black Death, Mackenzie has stated that this provides a clue as to when in time the young men may have visited. For all of this, many have criticised both the original event and Mackenzie's explanations. Skeptics have argued that it would be improbable for a village of Kersey's size to have had a butcher's shop in the 15th century, as meat was a luxury product that was primarily dealt with in towns or at visiting weekly markets. This rebuke, however, can be said to be just as speculative as Mackenzie's original remarks, and does nothing to address the cadet's reported sense of unease at being in a place which seemed far removed from expected reality. Ultimately, the Kersey case is a mystery which endures, with no explanation yet able to answer definitively what happened that day in 1957. It could be said that Johann Wolfgang von Goethe embodied every ideal of the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th and 19th centuries. He was an author, a playwright, a statesman, and his works have influenced nearly every subject, from literature to botany to medicine. His novels are now considered classics. As a playwright, he is best known as the author of Faust, which is considered by some to be the greatest work of German literature ever written. Having led such a rich and full life, it is not surprising that in his later years Goethe decided to write an autobiography to memorialise his younger days. Within it, he described a bizarre incident, which has perplexed readers ever since. According to Goethe's recollection, he was travelling along the footpath towards Drusenheim on horseback, thinking about how he had just left a woman named Frederica, whom he had great affection for. It was at this moment that he claimed to have witnessed a strange sight, his own figure coming towards him, also on horseback and on the same road. He wrote that he saw himself attired in a dress which I had never worn, it was pike grey, with somewhat of gold. In the autobiography, the figure is described as somewhat dreamlike, with Goethe having to shake himself from the vision, by which point the figure had entirely disappeared. It is strange, Goethe wrote. Eight years afterwards, I found myself on the very road to pay one more visit to Frederica, in the dress of which I had dreamed, and which I wore, not from choice, but by accident. Based on his description, it would seem that the German writer somehow perceived a future event whilst riding to Drusenheim that day. Did Goethe experience a time slip, in which he caught a glimpse of himself eight years in the future? Even though his experience does bear many of the characteristics of such an anomalous happening, some have criticised the event described in his book as having never happened. Instead, they claim that Goethe merely invented the event to use as a literary device, a metaphor meant to showcase his complex emotions about Frederica. Whilst this may be the case, his writing does suggest some sort of familiarity with such strange events, beyond that of a literary device. 
At the end of the passage, Goethe briefly expanded upon the nature of matters of this kind, possibly indicating that he regarded the incident as belonging to a class of experience outside of the usual. Not only that, as he wrote about this experience in his autobiography, titled From My Life, Poetry and Truth, it suggests that the anecdotes contained within relate to real events in his life. Arguably, Goethe would have considered it to be too confusing for the reader to have included a metaphorical event alongside real ones. As such, there is a good chance that Goethe experienced, or believed that he had experienced, something strange that day on the road to Drusenheim. Whether or not it was a time slip, however, remains a mystery. On an October morning in 1963, the Dean of Nebraska Wesleyan University, Dr. Sam Dahl, sent his secretary, Colleen Butibor, to the campus's C.C. White Building to give a message to a guest lecturer. Whilst searching for the lecturer on the first floor, Butibor's attention was drawn to the office suite at the north end of the building. All the windows were open, and the office was empty. Yet, after taking a few steps into the room, Butibor felt as though she was not alone. Allegedly struck by a strong and musty odour, it was then that she saw a woman who she did not recognise in the room with her. According to Butibor's testimony on the university's website, there was a tall, young, slender woman with black hair, standing with her back to me at a cabinet in an inner office. She was reaching up into one of the drawers. She claimed that she also felt the presence of a man sitting at the desk to her left. When she looked, there was no one there. What struck her most, however, was the scene outside. Looking out from one of the large windows behind the desk, the secretary supposedly witnessed scenery that appeared to be from another time. There were no streets, and the buildings that she knew were there had been replaced with open fields and trees. Frightened by what she was seeing, Butibor fled from the room. When she reported her experience to Dean Dahl afterwards, he, feeling curious, sought out a long-serving professor of political science, Dr. E. Glenn Callan. By now, there was a strong suspicion that Butibor had somehow stepped back in time. Without revealing the details of his secretary's experience, the Dean supposedly asked Callan if he remembered anyone at the university who might fit Butibor's description of the woman. Callan supposedly suggested Urania Clara Mills, a former music teacher at the university, who had taught piano, music theory, and the history of music there for 28 years. According to Dr. Roger Conyard, a former English professor at the university who joined the faculty just one year after the incident, it was then that Dean Dahl suggested Butibor meet with Professor Callan. Bizarrely, when she described to him the scene she claimed to have seen from the window, it did match what the university campus and the surrounding area used to look like. Area still, when Callan showed the secretary a series of old university yearbooks, she recognised Urania Clara Mills as the black-haired woman from her experience. Unbeknownst to Butibar, decades before, Mills had entered her office, sat on a chair, and perished of a heart attack. Conyard, who is claimed to have heard this story firsthand from the Dean himself, later described Dean Dahl as a credible man who accepted his secretary's story as gospel. The C.C. White building has since been torn down, with another building being erected in its place, but even so, the event that occurred there lives on. Colleen Butibor's testimony has been recorded and corroborated by multiple people and repeatedly investigated. It is even said that Urania Clara Mills has been seen by others in the Smith Curtis Administration Building, the building which now stands on the former site of the C.C. White Building. With all this in mind, what exactly did Colleen Butibau experience that morning in 1963? You can, of course, do your own research into these mysterious events online, and to help make researching deep into the internet safer, Dashlane can provision you with a web-browsing, password-protecting, safe-searching toolkit. 
Dashlane is a desktop and mobile app designed to make all the most irritating and risky parts of your digital life not only safer, but simpler. Trusted by over 11 million users in 180 countries, Dashlane manages and protects everything that matters. From securely autofilling personal info and payment details, to storing passwords intelligently and automatically, to ensuring safe, private internet browsing. Dashlane can save all your internet passwords and login information, making them accessible with one master password. You will never have to click Forgot Password again. And as your information is stored locally and not on the internet, using Dashlane is much safer than not using a password manager. Dashlane's dark web monitoring feature even scans the dark web on your behalf to make sure that your passwords are not being sold. Don't know how to generate secure passwords? Dashlane has you covered there too, by helping you to make strong, complex passwords for every account you own. Everything from obscure paranormal forum login details, to Netflix passwords, to credit card information, to your driver's license details, can be safely stored with Dashlane. Dashlane also helps you access websites from anywhere in the world. Their built-in VPN with country selection lets you access what you want, wherever you are. Most important of all, however, is that Dashlane does all this in one product for one price. Not only that, Dashlane is offering you a special discount. Head to dashlane.com paranormal and use my promo code paranormal to get 10% off their premium service. You wouldn't leave your front door unlocked, so why put yourself at risk when online? Try Dashlane today. In the autumn of 1973, Mrs. Jane O'Neill, a Cambridge schoolteacher, visited Fotheringhay Church in Norfolk, England. Fotheringhay Church is steeped in history, being particularly well known for once having been within the grounds of Fotheringhay Castle, the place where Mary Queen of Scots was executed in 1587. The ecclesiastical splendour of the church fascinated O'Neill, especially the picture of a crucifix behind the altar. So magnificent was the painting that it became a cherished memory for her. Later, when she told her friend, who also knew the church about it, O'Neill was dismayed to hear that her friend had never seen the image of the crucifix. In fact, as far as she was concerned, the picture did not exist. Confused, O'Neill called the postmistress of the church, the lady who arranged the flowers in the church every Sunday, and was shocked to hear her confirm that no such picture existed. O'Neill needed to go back to the church. This time, she invited her friend to come with her to help clarify the matter. When O'Neill arrived at the church, she claimed that it was not the same church she had visited before. So much was different. Perplexed and disturbed by this revelation, O'Neill began to research more about the history of the area and the church itself in an attempt to find out what exactly she had seen. During her research, she supposedly came across a description of the chancel, the part of a church near the altar reserved for the clergy and choir, which seemed to match what she had seen. She also discovered that this part of the church had been demolished in 1553, in the aftermath of England's religious reformation. Had O'Neill somehow stepped back in time to see the church in its pre-1553 splendour? Some have ascribed O'Neill's experience to post-traumatic stress. Earlier that autumn, she had suffered a deep trauma, when she was the first on the scene of a gruesome road accident. She had helped pull passengers out of the wreck and get them to hospital. On her way home later that day, she claimed to have seen injured passengers appear in front of her. Soon after this incident, she visited Norfolk and had her alleged time slip experience. Thus, it could be argued that her experience at the church in Fotheringhay was some sort of post-traumatic hallucination, which, given her recent encounter with people near death, took on a religious undertone. Yet, this hypothesis does not explain O'Neill's inexplicable knowledge of the church's appearance before its partial demolition in 1553. If it was a hallucination, why was the church she saw so similar to the historical description she later found? Is it possible that Jane O'Neill stepped back in time and saw Fotheringhay Church in its prime? Fotheringhay 
For decades, there has been an ongoing mystery in the county of Suffolk, England. The enigma centers on a house in the area of Ruffham, a house which, despite many claiming to have seen it, does not actually exist. One of the earliest recorded accounts of someone seeing this vanishing house was in 1926. Around this time, Ruth Wynne was tutoring Evelyn Allington, and they would customarily take walks in the afternoon together after their lessons. In October of 1926, they made a trip to the nearby church. Along the way, they claimed to have seen a high wall of greenish-yellow bricks. When the pair followed this wall around a corner, they encountered tall wrought iron gates set in the wall. Beyond the gates, there was a driveway set among tall trees, which led to a large house with a stucco frontage that bore windows of Georgian design. The two ladies thought it odd that they had not yet met the owners of such a grand manor, but as they took a different route on their way back, they did not have any reason to question the experience as anything other than ordinary. The following spring, the two of them took the same route. However, where they had seen the house before, lay only a wilderness of tumbled earth, weeds, mounds, all overgrown with the trees they had seen on their first visit. Struck by the strangeness of the missing house, Ruth wrote down their experience and submitted it to BBC Radio, which had a program that dealt with supernatural topics. Their walk had only been a mile and a half long, with no houses similar to the one they had described for many miles. And, as they had arrived at the church as they had planned both times, they were certain the route had been the same on both occasions. Even so, when others heard their story, their tone was generally dismissive. At the time, it was thought that the ladies had merely been lost when they saw the house, with the route they took on their second walk different from the first. The testimony of Ruth Wynne may be the earliest recorded experience concerning Ruffham's vanishing house. Yet, if an article featured in the gardening magazine Amateur Gardening in December 1975 can be believed, then there may be a longer tradition. A local resident in the area, writing under the pen name James Cobbold, stated that he had first heard mention of the house from a local little girl of around his own age in about 1911 or 1912. At the time, he had laughed at her, but when he mentioned the girl's story to his grandmother, she supposedly told him that when she was a young unmarried woman, her father had claimed to have seen the very same house. Placing the date at around 1860, the author of the article explained how his great-grandfather, Robert Palfrey, had been thatching a haystack in June when all of a sudden he noticed a house on the other side of the narrow lane. Palfrey, a local man, was described as having known those parts like the palm of his hand and did not recognize the house. He was puzzled and not a little scared, claiming that it had not been there ten minutes earlier. According to the grandmother's story, he described the building in great detail, explaining that it had been made of a solid red brick, with two entrances, a quite small one and a somewhat larger one. Both had ornamental iron gates which were closed. The property was also described as having a beautiful garden, with roses and flower beds in full bloom. When Palfrey returned later that evening with his family in order to show them the peculiar house, it was gone. Shortly after hearing this account from his grandmother, Cobbold wrote that he, too, experienced the vanishing house. At the time of writing, he claimed that encounters with the house were still discussed, with a young man from the village only a few weeks before relating to him how his father had seen the same thing happening at least twice during the past ten years. And certainly, these are not the only testimonies to have been shared regarding the house. Edward Bentley, a local worker, claimed to have seen the house vanish in the 1940s. Sandra Harwick and a local postwoman supposedly saw it around 1976. A retired couple, Jean and Sidney Batram, alleged to have seen it in 2007. Carl Grove, someone who has done extensive research into the Ruffham case, has stated that almost everybody from Ruffham knows someone who has seen the house. Many have researched this case in an attempt to find out if there ever was such a house in the location described by witnesses. 
Perhaps all these people had experienced time slips and had caught a glimpse of a now long gone structure. Patching together the testimonies, it is believed that the witnesses all saw the house in the vicinity of a patch of woodland called Colville's Grove. And, intriguingly, from various pieces of evidence uncovered by different researchers, it does indeed seem that a great building once stood in the area. It is in and around Colville's Grove that several residents have, in the past, claimed to have dug up very good quality bricks, going on to use them for driveways, walls and other projects. A local historian, Phil Sage, has stated that there may have been a house in the area called King's Hall, but not much is known about it. Then there is an official government produced map from 1837. Where today there is nothing but trees in the grove, the map indicates a driveway leading to what appears to have been a grand house. Might this be the house which so many have claimed to have seen whilst passing through the area? Whilst Ruffham's disappearing house does appear to be a very convincing case, there are discrepancies in the descriptions given by many eyewitnesses that cannot be ignored. Some state that the house is red brick, others that it is coated in a fine plaster. It may, of course, be the case that people have slipped through time to see the property at various points in its history, and as such are describing it slightly differently. As only a handful of testimonies have been detailed enough to enable further investigation, more research is undoubtedly required. Perhaps most strange of all, however, is that the disappearing house of Ruffham is not the only such case in the area. Whilst this case may have the most witnesses, there are reports of other vanishing houses in towns nearby. Also, considering that Ruffham is a mere half an hour's drive from Kersey, a location known for its own remarkable time slip case, it may very well be that Suffolk is a hotbed for time slip phenomena. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this and haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe for more of the paranormal. To receive notifications of new videos, make sure you have clicked the bell icon next to my subscription box. And if you cannot wait until my next video, why not check out the one suggested on screen now. Until next time.